let's take out our Bibles and learn together. Shalom, blessings, and welcome to everyone watching our video today from all over the world. And as always, of course, a very warm welcome to you, Baruch. How are you, Baruch? Thank God, Christian. Shalom from Israel to you and your family. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, um, we are uh, discussing a very, uh, once again, it could be deemed as a debated theme, but we've had a lot of people writing to us, um, asking us, tell us about the Seventh-day Adventist church. Are they saved? They've even asked us, if we're Seventh-day Adventists, maybe because of the Shabbat, the observance of Shabbat. But of course, we'll cover that because there is a difference, a significant difference there as well, which Baruch will cover later on. And um, basically, the, the Seventh-day Adventists, they hold 28 fundamental beliefs that constitute the church's official doctrinal position. We'll examine a few of those against what the Bible says, always going back to Scripture. So if you're ready, Baruch, let's begin. Okay, so Seventh-day Adventist versus biblical teachings. So let's commence. By a way of introduction, of course, as always, we have made uh, um, available both in English and Spanish-speaking uh, viewers, both uh, scriptures and comments in English and Spanish. And let's start with an introduction on the Seventh-day Adventist. So the Seventh-day Adventism has its roots in Adventism, that a 19th century movement that anticipated the imminent appearance or advent of Jesus Christ. The Adventists were also called Millerites because the group was founded by William Miller, a false prophet who predicted that Jesus would return in either 1843 or 1844, which obviously didn't happen. One of the seers who covered for Miller was a 17-year-old lady by the name of Ellen G. Harmon, who later married and was known as Ellen G. White. Ellen soon became a beacon of hope for the delusions, the disillusioned Millerites. She united Adventist factions and became the spiritual guide for a new religious group. Ellen G. White also had numerous false teachings and prophecies. We thought we'd put this out here right away by a way of introduction because there's a clear false prophecies from the time this movement was established. We're going to look at other things in comparison to scripture later on. Baruch, your opening comments. Whenever there's an emphasis on someone being a prophet, usually it goes very uh, poorly thereafter. There should be an emphasis on, on the word of God and its revelation. But whenever the authority and the source of truth becomes an individual, you can guarantee soon thereafter there's going to be problems with that movement. And instead of it being something that's simply based in the movement of the Holy Spirit, it becomes focused on an individual or a group of people or a family. And this is one of the tendencies of movements that are, are really a cult and not of the Spirit of God. Amen. Thank you. Uh, we encourage you, brothers and sisters, to please have your Bibles with you. We will be looking at a number of scriptures. Uh, we won't, unfortunately, put the whole scriptures up on the screen normally as we do, because we have to get through quite a few of them. We also encourage you to go back and do your own research. Um, you don't have to take my word for it, Baruch's word for it. We're just trying to shed some light on questions that we're being asked. So let's continue, Baruch. Now, I think that's where a lot of the confusion lies. For some reason, we've been asked whether we're Seventh-day Adventists because of um, different resources and different reasons. But let's look at their beliefs and let's look what the Bible teaches us. Shabbat or Sabbath. Can you just, Baruch, just give us an overview of the differences between the true Sabbath observance and what the Seventh-day Adventist, how they treat their Shabbat observance. Well, I, I'm not all that abreast on Seventh-day Adventists, but I will say this. One of the common problems, and this goes for, for beyond the Seventh-day Adventists, but they associate Shabbat with the day of worship. 
we do not see in the scripture a day of worship. We see worship each day. We know, for example, Daniel, he uh, worshiped three times a day, every day. And when you talk about Shabbat, and let me just simply say that uh, during the time of the temple, there were special sacrifices offered on Shabbat. There is no altar today. There is no temple today. Therefore, the Shabbat cannot be mandated and observed according to the law of Moses. But, but that doesn't mean that the Shabbat doesn't have relevance and significance. Therefore, we can still, in the spirit, as Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 6, not in the letter of the law, but in the renewal of the spirit, apply Sabbath truth to our life. And the word that truly surrounds Shabbat is menucha, which is rest. And it's not a word that simply means to do nothing, to relax, to take a nap. But this word menucha has to do with, with being positioned, being in the right location spiritually. So often what we hear is Shabbat is a day of restriction, where biblically Shabbat is a day of restoration where we push out the things of the world and we want to refocus on God because the things of the world are daily responsibilities, work and such, and the responsibilities of life oftentimes pushes us away from where God wants us to be. Shabbat is a time that is set aside for, for reconnecting with God in a very, very a specific manner with his word, with worship, where you're not uh, having the constraints of this life being imposed upon you on that day. It's not something that we're legalistic about. We're something that we're, we, we believe it's something that we should, should embrace with joy and thanksgiving. Oftentimes, people want to emphasize what not to do on Shabbat, but, but when we look at the scripture, we find the expression la sot et ha shabbat to do the Sabbath. So it's something to do to focus on God, to push the things out of the world, to reconnect by means of scripture, and to, to not do the things that are going to interfere with a focus on God. So that's a biblical Shabbat expression. Amen. Now, some people have also approached us and said, well, you know, there's really not a lot of difference between the Seventh-day Adventists and Christians and uh, other types of denomination that we know are born again and Bible-believing people. Now, we're going to look at some things that need to be seriously examined and taken a closer look at because there are some significant differences and things that need to be exposed. Now, of course, on the left-hand side of the screen here is um, Adventist beliefs. And on the right, in the orangey color, we look at the actual Bible teachings, what the Bible tells us. And we've just put there five points of difference. They believe here that hell is not eternal. That's one of their beliefs and teachings. However, let's look at a couple of scriptures Matthew 25, 46 says very clearly, if you have your Bibles with us, and these will go away into the everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Just to quote another scripture there, Revelation 21, 8, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Your comments, Baruch, about those teachings that hell is not eternal. More and more, I'm encountering people that have kind of a, what they call an annihilation theology, that, that God will destroy the, the sinner's soul, meaning that there's a punishment, but that punishment comes to an end. And just what uh, you put on the screen, they believe that hell is temporary. There's not everlasting. But when we look at the scripture, we see, for example, in the Old Testament, in Daniel chapter 12, it talks about eternal condemnation. Also in the New Testament, you pointed out, it's eternal torment. So when we leave this body, we go into eternity in a unique way. 
and it's either going to be eternal life in the kingdom or ultimately. And when we look at hell, we can use that in a more general sense, talking about the lake of fire, because uh, hell will end, but the punishment will not. It's simply after the great white throne judgment, those that were in hell are cast into the lake that burns with fire and sulfur forever and ever. So in one sense, that same type of, of torment in hell and fire and flames continues, but it's simply in the same way that, that the millennial kingdom passes away, the same way that heaven passes away into the new Jerusalem, we find that, that hell, the punishment is eternal, the torment is eternal, but those souls that are being tormented there ultimately after the great white throne judgment are cast into the lake that burns with fire and sulfur forever and ever. So the punishment of hell is indeed eternal. Correct. The other teaching that they have is the sins of believers will be placed on Satan. Now we made reference to one scripture there in first Peter two twenty four, specifically the opposite that he who himself talking about Yeshua bore our sins in his own body on a tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Another, of course, scripture is 1 John 2, 2. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the whole world. Your comments, Baruch. Again, I don't know of any scripture that would point to the sins being placed upon Satan. It's just a fabrication. It's something that someone came up with. There's no biblical basis for that. Uh, our sins being placed on Satan would make him the redeemer. How her heretical is that? And how dishonoring to Messiah such a belief is. So very problematic. No scriptural basis for it. And offensive and insulting to the true Lord and Savior, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. One of the other things they teach is that Jesus is also the angel Michael. We put a reference there in Matthew 16, 15, 16, highlighting the true scripture, where he said to them, by who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You look at another scripture as well in Matthew 3, 16 to 17. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately for the water and behold, the heavens were open to him. He saw the spirit descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Over to you, Baruch, for your comments about uh, that type of teaching. Yeah, there's there's no, again, basis in the scripture to, to unite Michael, the archangel, with Yeshua. Simply not done. No scriptural connection between the two as being one. So again, it's all based upon the thoughts of man and not just the thoughts of man, but the thoughts of men that are influenced by the enemy because he is the father of all lies. And to say that Yeshua, he is the eternal, the unique son of God, the only son of God in that sense, being divine and Michael being an angel is created. He's not eternal. So again, very offensive to the uniqueness and the character and the true biblical identity of, of Yeshua. Amen. And for anyone wanting more scriptural references that Michael is just an angel, we can refer you to Jude 9, Daniel 10, 13. They're just a couple of scriptures that clearly define Michael as an angel. Soul sleep. Now, this is something that uh, is very uh, widely taught in Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, for those who are Seventh-day Adventists and, and are curious, soul sleep is a belief that after the person dies, his or her soul sleeps until the resurrection and final judgment. The concept of soul sleep is not biblical. When the Bible describes a person as sleeping in relation to death, like in Luke 8.52, sorry, Luke 8, verse 52, or 1 Corinthians 15, 16, it does not mean literal sleep. Sleeping is just a way to describe death because uh, a dead body appears to be asleep. 
we want to look at the scripture that we put there in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, where it states, we are confident, yes, we'll please rather that, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord or home with the Lord. Your comments, Baruch, because this is very important. There's no evidence when someone dies that they go into a state of unconsciousness and sleep. For example, when we look at an account, and many people will say it's a parable, there's nothing in and of itself when it speaks about the account of Lazarus and the rich man. There's nothing to say that this is a parable. It's a, in my opinion, an historical account. It points to the divinity of Messiah. Who else would know what's going on in Sheol? So we see that at first, before Messiah's work of redemption, his death, burial, and resurrection, when someone died, if they believed in the promise of a redeemer, had that same faith of Abraham, they would descend into what's called Chek Avraham, Avraham's bosom. Bosom is this part of the body here. It's the chest cavity, the heart. Heart is synonymous with thinking. So Abraham's bosom had to go, had to do with where people went when they had the same faith of Abraham, believing that, that the promise of redemption would come. And those who rejected and did not have that faith of Abraham, they went into what's called Gehinom or hell. What we know is that, that today, Messiah, it says in Ephesians, that he took captivity captive, meaning that he emptied out Abraham's bosom. And now, just like the scripture that, that you spoke of some from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when a believer dies at that instant, that soul goes to the presence of Messiah in heaven. So the term, as you pointed out, sleeping has to do with, with simply a faith when someone goes to bed, usually they have an expectation of getting up in the morning. And therefore, in Judaism, and this is also true in the Bible, death was spoken of, as you pointed out, Christian, as sleep, simply because one would go to sleep, but there was an expectation of getting up. And it spoke of death as sleeping because we should have an expectation of the resurrection. So so sleep, we don't see any evidence in the scripture when it looks and talks to people like like Lazarus. He uh, was conscious. He was with Abraham's Abraham himself in that location. The rich man spoke. He recognized Abraham. He recognized Lazarus. No one was sleeping. So it's a failure to understand the the terms that the Bible's using and why they use those terms. So so sleep, a false doctrine. Thank you, Baruch. Uh, now, the last one, we've touched on that a little bit, linked to a little bit of their views that hell is not eternal, mortal soul, uh, the state of the dead, the Adventists, of course, that we've touched on previously, believe that death is unconscious sleep, commonly known as soul sleep, and reject the idea of an immortal soul. Uh, it, it's basic conditional immortality. So they teach that the wicked will not suffer eternal torment in hell, but instead will be permanently destroyed after a specific period of time. We, of course, have so many more scriptures that we could put than just John 3.16, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 11, 25 to 26, when Yeshua said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? I mean, once again, we could spend hours probably here sharing multiple, multiple scriptures. But your comments, Baruch, on once again, that mortal soul teaching. It, it all goes back to the first doctrine we mentioned. As you said, they don't want the punishment to be forever. And this is very attractive to, to many people. Okay, I'll suffer, but it'll end. It's not forever and ever and ever. And in my opinion, when you really see what they say and how they use this doctrine, it's a way to cause people to come to, to their uh, meetings, their denomination, because people like that. Okay, uh, eternal life 
fine forever, but the punishment is limited to a, a period of time. People like that. The simple truth is that the punishment is eternal, eternal torment, where there will be gnashing of teeth forever and ever. So again, it's a great example of, of using desires, what I want to be, and making that our doctrine rather than relying upon what the scripture says. And whenever you say, well, the Bible says this, but we believe that, you know that you're going in the wrong direction and that you have associated with a group that is not submissive to the authority of the word of God. Amen. Just before I hand over to you, Baruch, for your final comments, once again, brothers and sisters, we do this in love, exposing truth. This is very, very important. We need to bring truth to the surface. We do what we love. Um, but, you know, some people will even argue with us and say, well, you know, there really isn't that much of a difference or why are you, uh, you know, focusing on faults of other uh, faiths or religions. We feel it's very, very important to share truth. So I'm just going to hand over to you, Baruch, for your final comments. We are committed to what the Bible says, and we want to submit to that revelation from God. And the reason why that we thought it was necessary to do this short video concerning the seven-day Adventists is because much of their doctrine is in conflict with Scripture. And the motivation for their false doctrine is to please individuals, to say something to them that is going to draw them in. We're not about drawing people in under the disguise of falsehood. We want to share the truth and believe that the Holy Spirit will witness to a sincere person who is coming before God, recognizing that God is eternal, that God is the authority, that he is the judge, and therefore want to participate in submissiveness in obedience to God's revelation. So that's why we always emphasize the Bible, because when we study the scripture, we can grasp what God is commanding us to do. And again, many people don't like the fact that God commands. He's the authority. And whenever people move away from the word of God, it is because of their will rather than bringing their desires before God so that he will change us and give us his desires that we might be an instrument of obedience. That's such an important desire that every believer should have, to be an instrument of obedience, meaning that we serve God, we're his vessel, and we obey what he commands us to do, knowing that his purposes, his will, his instructions are the best. The best for us from an eternal standpoint, and also the best for others. When we submit, we can be a blessing, we can be a help. And that's really what we want to be a blessing to you, and also a help in your walk with the living Savior, the one who redeemed you by dying upon that cross. And of course, we're speaking of Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the only eternal Son of God. Thank you, Baruch. Um, praise God. Thank you for uh, sharing some light on this important theme. Um, if you have any questions or comments, we invite you to either write to us at Australasia at loveisrael.org, or you can make comments like many people do on YouTube. We, of course, we, we thank the hundreds, if not thousands of people that have been supportive and making comments uh, or writing to us. There's always a small minority of keyboard warriors that they, they don't agree with one the things that we say, and they sometimes get a bit disrespectful, but we have no tolerance for that. We'll always delete those uh, uh, messages immediately. But Baruch, thank you uh, for sharing light on this very, very important subject. Any final comments? Just let's be people who, who look to God's word. Let's be individuals that, that approach God's word with the desire to hear and obey what God reveals. There's nothing better than being in a submissive relationship with the living God. Amen. Thank you, Baruch. Brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us. We hope it's been a blessing to you. 
And God willing, we will see you very soon for another video. Shalom. God bless you.